while reviewing various daily articles about the podcasting industry, because as you might have noticed, we at Prefovi uh, produce and broadcast podcasts. I recently came across the podcast series, The Unfiltered History Tour with Vice World News. This series broadcasts stories of disputed artifacts as told by people from their homelands. This is, this is what it says in the website of The Unfiltered History Tour. And these series are in relation to artifacts which are held or stored at the British Museum in London in the United Kingdom. I listened to the 10 episodes and was moved by how strongly the defendants of the people to whom these objects belonged, such as an Egyptian researcher for the Rosetta Stone, a filmmaker from Rapa Nui for the statue Oa Akananaya, an artist and writer from the Kingdom of Benin in Nigeria for the Benin Bronzes, a Ghanaian drummer for the Akan drum, an Indian intellectual from the Amaravati marbles, Jamaican citizens for the figurines Birdman and Bonoyel, descendants of Aborigines for the Australian Geargold shield, a Greek university student and activist for the Parthenon marbles, Chinese descendants for the porcelain vases and sculptures taken from the Summer Palace in China, and an Assyrian writer and artist for the artwork describing the lion hunt of Ashur Banipal. So these were the 10 stories which are featured in this series, the um, Unfiltered History Tour with Vice World News. And I was deeply moved while we listening to them because these people who were interviewed felt uh, very strongly about the injustice to have these disputed objects stuck at the British Museum in the UK. So while the British Museum acknowledges that there are contested objects in its collection, sick, nothing has pragmatically and tangentially been done so far by UK authorities to return those extremely contentious cultural assets to the descendants of the people from whom they were taken. Similar claims for cultural assets restitution were made to other UK institutions and museums, as well as to French museums, such as the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris, a museum featuring the indigenous art and cultures of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. I decided to delve into these legal issues deeper. What is the state of play in relation to obligations of restitution of objects stolen or taken or bought during the discovery and colonization periods, as well as after, by the UK and France in visited, colonized, or ex-colonized countries? What is the legal framework applicable to these cultural assets, restitution disputes, and claims? How can the descendants of the people whose artifacts were stolen efficiently and effectively obtain restitution of their objects from French and UK institutions as soon as possible. So let's have a look first at the legal framework for cultural assets restitution. And let's start, of course, with the highest source of, um, of law which exists, which are international conventions. International law provides for free conventions which apply to cultural assets restitution. The UNESCO conventions, as well as the Unidroit Convention. Various UNESCO conventions, such as the Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict dated 14th of May 1954, the 1954 Hague Convention, and the Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property dated 14th of November 1970, were adopted to protect cultural property, such as monuments of architecture, art or history, archeological sites, works of art, manuscripts, books, and other objects of artistic, historical, or archeological interest, as well as scientific collections of any kind, regardless of their origin or ownership. While France ratified both UNESCO Convention in 1957 and 1997, respectively, 
The UK belatedly ratified the 1954 Hague Convention in 2017 and accepted, in brackets, but did not ratify the 1970 UNESCO Convention in 2022. The commitments made by the state parties, the contracting parties to these UNESCO conventions, serve to preserve cultural heritage through the implementation of the following measures in Teralia. Declaring the import, export, or transfer of ownership of cultural property affected contrarily to the provisions adopted under the 1970 convention by the state parties there to illicit. Declaring the export and transfer of ownership of cultural property under compulsion arising directly or indirectly from the occupation of a country by a foreign power illicit. Adopting preventing measures such as preparing inventories, planning emergency measures to protect property against the risk of fire or the collapse of buildings, and preparing the removal of cultural property to places of safety. Developing initiatives, which guarantee respect for cultural property situated on their own territory or on the territory of other state parties. This involves refraining from using such property in any manner that might expose it to destruction or deterioration in the event of an armed conflict and by refraining from all acts of hostility directed against it. Registering cultural property of very high importance on the International Register of Cultural Property and a special protection in order to obtain special protection for such property. Marking certain important buildings and monuments with a distinctive emblem of the conventions. Providing a place for eventual refuge to shelter movable cultural property. Establishing special units within the military forces responsible for the protection of cultural property, setting sanctions for breaches of the conventions and promoting the conventions among the general public and through target groups such as cultural heritage professionals and military or law enforcement agencies. So these are some of the provisions set out in those two 1954 and 1970 UNESCO conventions with a, a view of protecting cultural assets. These UNESCO conventions have a limited scope with respect to artifacts taken or stolen before their entry into force. Indeed, many objects now in museum collections were acquired from their original owners via violence or deceit or in conditions linked to the asymmetry of a colonial context. Even before the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 entered into force, when the practices of looting and bringing back trophies were still admissible. The collection of foreign objects by scientific missions financed by colonizing states during the exploration and conquest of new territories was another way to unilaterally obtain foreign cultural assets widely used in parallel to and jointly with military operations orchestrated by the same governments. The acquisition context is therefore going to be determining in the treatment of restitution requests because those above mentioned acts are not legally qualified as crimes pursuant to international law. This is contrary to Nazi spoliations against which the inter-allied declaration against acts of dispossession committed in territories under enemy occupation of control dated 5th of January 1943 a specific legal act was adopted. Also, this is contrary to pillages and destructions in wartime posterior to the above mentioned 1954 Hague Convention. Secondly, many objects from public collections were gifted or bequeathed to museums by the heirs of colons, military men involved in the conquest operations, colonies, administrators, or missionaries, sometimes several decades after the death of their ancestors. The terms of the initial acquisition of these objects, which spread over almost a century and a half, may be very diverse. Spoils of war, of course, thefts, gifts, more or less freely consented, but also barter, purchases, fair or not, 
or even direct orders made to local artisans and artists. Most of the time, the museum that is the beneficiary of those gifts, already ancient, has limited information on the terms of the first acquisition of these objects, and even sometimes on their exact provenance. These objects do not fall into the scope of the above mentioned two UNESCO conventions. Also, those UNESCO conventions do not have any effect in relation to cultural assets which are held in private hands as confirmed by the legal case relating to a restitution request made for the NOC statues by Nigeria. I quote here, the provisions of the 1970 UNESCO convention are not directly applicable in the internal public order of state parties. Therefore, MX, one of the parties, well, the defendant in this case, therefore MX is right in arguing that this convention only provides for obligations applying to state parties and does not create any direct obligation against private citizens of these state parties. This is an extract from the judgment from the Court of Appeal of Paris handed down on the 5th of April 2004, which was subsequently confirmed by a judgment from the Court of Cassation handed down on the 20th of September 2006. The case is Federal Republic of Nigeria versus MX. Finally, these two UNESCO conventions do not provide for any restitution mechanisms in relation to any stolen or looted cultural property, thereby leaving a legal void in international law with respect to art restitutions. But do not fret, because the UNIDRA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects dated 24th of June 1995, the UNIDRA Convention, fills this gap. It is therefore complementary to these two UNESCO conventions. The UNIDRA Convention is an important step of establishing a common mechanism and minimal legal rules for the restitution and return of cultural assets between contracting states with the objective of improving the preservation and protection of the cultural heritage in the interest of all. Indeed, the UNIDRA Convention applies to claims of an international character for number one, the restitution of stolen cultural objects and number two, the return of cultural objects removed from the territory of a contracting state, contrary to a law regulating the export of cultural objects for the purpose of protecting its cultural heritage. But the scope of a UNIDRA convention is limited in practice because countries such as France and the UK, where a considerable portion of illegally exported cultural assets and stolen cultural objects taken during the colonization period is stored in national public collections, have either not ratified or not even signed for the UK such UNIDRA convention. France has signed the UNIDRA convention but not ratified it, while the UK has neither signed nor ratified the UNIDRA convention. Also, some time restrictions to claims for restitution of stolen or eagerly exported cultural objects are set out in the UNIDRA Convention. Such claims may be brought in three years from the time the claimant or the requesting state knew the location of the cultural object and the identity of a possessor, and in 50 years since the time of the theft, the export, or from the date on which the object should have been returned. However, there are exceptions to this rule for stolen objects in the UNIDRA Convention. Cultural objects that form an integral part of an identified monument or archaeological site or which belong to a public collection are not subject to time limitations other than a period of three years from the time when the claimant knew the location of a cultural object and the identity of its possessor. In addition, a contracting state may declare that a claim warrants an extended time limit of 75 years or longer, if so stated in its national law. This is provided at Article 3.5 of the UNIDRA Convention, for example. Besides, the UNIDRA Convention is not a retroactive treaty, and as such, 
it only applies to cultural property stolen or cultural objects illegally exported after the UNIDRA Convention entered into force. However, the UNIDRA Convention does not in any way legitimize any illegal transaction of whatever which has taken place before the entry into force of this convention. And the UNIDRA Convention does not limit any right of a state or other person to make a claim under remedies available outside the framework of a convention. So it does give a leeway, so to speak, for the states to decide how they want to play it uh, in terms of making some, rest some uh, cultural assets restitution claims, the UNIDRA Convention is limited in scope. At least it gives a good base of a mechanism on how to systematically organize restitution claims. So now that we've looked at what international law provides in relation to restitution of cultural assets, let's have a, have a look at the European Union legislation. It is Directive 2014-60-EU of the 15th of May 2014, which applies in this respect. And it relates to the return of cultural objects unlawfully removed from the territory of a member state. So this issue of writing and adopting common rules between states to guarantee the restitution of cultural assets has first emerged in Europe and more precisely within member states of the European Union. EU member states benefit from economic, cultural and legal integration tools which are highly developed on certain aspects and in particular on restitution of cultural assets. But the implementation and benefit from these automatic restitution mechanisms for cultural assets which were stolen or illicitly exported are limited to EU member states only, of course. So this directive of the 15th of May 2014 on the return of cultural objects and lawfully removed from the territory of a member state provides for this EU-wide right of restitution of cultural assets. Since Brexit, the UK is no longer a member state of the EU and therefore this directive no longer applies on its territory. However, the directive applies in France, one of the remaining 27 EU member states, via its transposition into French national statutory laws. This directive is very hands-on. Uh, it's a very hands-on framework on how cultural assets should be returned within which time frame and under which conditions. However, when the request for restitution comes from a third party state, i.e. not a EU member state, the protection of the buyer acting in good faith, as well as the principle of territoriality of laws, which is the principle pursuant to which the judge will rule only in compliance with the law of a country in which the object is located at the moment of a restitution claim. So these two principles, the protection of a buyer acting in good faith, as well as the principle of territoriality of laws, usually block any successful outcome to such restitution requests. So in case the request for restitution comes from a state outside the EU, the above mentioned UNESCO 1954 and 1970 conventions apply, but as already stated, they have limited scope. The imbalance between the law applicable in EU member states and the principles that the judge uses against third party states located outside Europe seriously impacts the future of cultural assets restitutions to countries located in Africa. Asia, Australasia, and the Americas. Such imbalance could be addressed if France and the UK, as well as African, Asian, and Australasian uh, countries ratified the above mentioned UNIDRA Convention. This convention sets out an automatic restitution mechanism, which would apply to its contracting states. It could be the foundation for a common right to restitution, in particular and potentially in relation to cultural assets taken during the colonial period, with all the restrictions that I mentioned before. The ratification of the UNIDRA Convention may therefore be the key to set up an automatic restitution mechanism, not only in the EU, but also outside the EU.
EU member states have applied such ambitions by infusing the principles from the INIDRA Convention within the directive. Therefore, the extension of such principles to third party states via the UNIDRA Convention should be in the future achievable. Let's hope so. Now, let's have a look at the French rules. The current French legal framework is set up in such a way that it blocks and opposes most restitution requests addressed to French museums with respect to their museum collections via its provisions from the Code du Patrimoine, which entered into force in 2004, and provisions from the Code Général des Propriétés des Personnes Publiques, which entered into force in 2006. The French current legal framework sets out a definition of the public domain furniture, which covers all cultural assets, in particular, public collections. Such definition of a French public domain furniture triggers some legal protection backed up by the rules of imprescriptibility and inalienability of a public domain, which blocks all restitution requests. So basically, pursuant to French law, when these cultural assets are into the French public domain furniture, then they cannot be sold and they cannot be returned and or gifted. Indeed, the statutory principle of inalienability of French public collections enshrined in Article L4515 of the Code du Patrimoine is opposed to the transfer of ownership of any one of these assets preserved in these collections. This is because all assets belonging to the French public collections are national treasures pursuant to Article L111 of the Code du Patrimoine. In France, the rare restitution cases which took place during the last 20 years were made possible via mechanisms designed to go around the rules relating to the French public domain. Two legal avenues were pursued. The first one was enacting a law creating an exception to the principle of inalienability of French public collections, derogating to the above mentioned rules applicable to the French cultural assets and public domain. So, for example, law 2002-323, dated 2nd of March 2002, relating to the authorization of a restitution by France of the mortal remains of Sarji, Sarah Bartman, also known as the Otent Tot Venus, to South Africa. There was another law, law number 2010-501, dated the 18th of May 2010, which related to the authorization of a restitution by France of the Maori heads to New Zealand. And these are laws providing for exceptions to the principle of inalienability on the grounds of the principle of dignity and of the respect due to dead people. You might have noticed that those two laws relate to the restitution of mortal remains. Yeah. So the other legal avenue which was pursued to go around uh, this, uh, this, this overarching principle of inalienability of the public domain is removing a cultural asset from the scope of the laws relating to the French public domain, because such object does not belong to the museum's collection. For example, artworks stamped Musée National Récupération since 1953, which are, compri which are comprised of 60,000 works pillaged by Nazi occupiers and never restituted, were never added to the French public collections, precisely in order to allow their restitution once the owners or right holders would be identified or recognized. Also, the restitutions of Chinese cultural assets done in 2015 were possible via the withdrawal at the request of the French state of a gift made a few years earlier by a private collector to the Guimet Museum, Musée Guimet. Consequently, rebranded as private property, these objects were able to be restituted directly by the donor, private donor, to the Chinese state. Moreover, the removal of the cultural asset from the French public domain may be due to an irreparable original defect tainting its acquisition. 
objects coming from illegal trafficking entered into French public collections after 1997, since France ratified the 1917 UNESCO Convention in January 1997, so objects coming from illegal trafficking entered into French public collections after 1997 because of some negligence in controlling their provenance upon acquisition or uh, which illicit status was revealed further to discovering new facts may be the object of a cancellation of a acquisition by way of sale, gift or donation via legal proceedings initiated by the defrauded French public entity. This is in compliance with law number 2016-925, dated 7th of July 2016. The object is therefore deemed to have never entered the French public domain, and new article L124-1 of the Code du Patrimoine provides that the judge may order its restitution to its original owner. So France has a very strict principle, but it's managed to find some way to soften uh, these rules by way of taking some ad hoc and exceptional laws. What about the UK rules now? Similarly, the current UK legal framework is set up in such a way that it blocks and opposes restitution requests addressed to UK museums with respect to their museum collections. As mentioned in uh, this uh, webinar's introduction, London's British Museum is fiercely targeted by growing calls for repatriation of cultural assets with repeated requests from various countries such as Greece, Ethiopia, Italy and Nigeria to return items from its vast collection. However, the British Museum and the UK government have systematically opposed those restitution requests by citing the British Museum Act 1963, a national statute which prohibits the institution from returning works. Indeed, Section 5, Disposal of Objects from the British Museum Act 1963, provides that, and I quote here, the trustees of the British Museum may sell, exchange, give away, or otherwise dispose of any object vested in them and comprising their collections if, number one, the object is a duplicate of another such object or number two the object appears to the trustees to have been made not earlier from the year 1850 and substantially consists of printed matter of which a copy made by photography or a process akin to photography is held by the trustees or and three in the opinion of the trustees the object is unfit to be retained in the collection of a museum and can be disposed of without detriment to the interests of students, provided that where an object has become vested in the trustees by virtue of a gift or a bequest the powers conferred by the sub subsection shall not be exercisable as respects that object in a manner inconsistent with any condition attached to the gift or bequests. Okay, so that was a bit of a complicated way uh, of putting it, but basically the option number three is if the object isn't fit to be retained, the trustees can decide to dispose of it, provided that it won't be against the inter interest of students, and also provided that it is not inconsistent with any condition attached to a gift or bequest that is the origin of uh, such object being brought into the collection of the British Museum. Okay. So similar, very limited exceptions to the principle that objects from UK public collections cannot be deaccessioned are set out in the National Heritage Act 1983, which focuses on the collections from the Victorian Albert Museum, the Science Museum, etc. The UK has enacted only two acts so far which carve additional exceptions to the principle of prohibition of returning works from UK public collections. So the first act uh, relates to the Human Tissue Act 2004, which creates a new exception to the provisions of British Museum Act 1963 and to the uh, National Heritage Act 1983. Indeed, pursuant to the Human Tissue Act 2004, the trustees of British Museum have the power 
to deaccession human remains and return them to their owners and or the defendants of such deceased persons. Consequently, the British Museum has set up a, a very pragmatic policy on its website, which sets out the circumstances in which the trustees may consider a request for the deaccessioning of human remains. It gives guidance on the procedures to be followed by those seeking to submit a claim for the return of human remains in the British Museum collection that are less than 1,000 years old to a community of origin. So as you can see, this is the same type of uh, exception than the one carved out by the French authorities. This is in relation to mortal remains which may be returned to communities of origin. The second act, which provides for some additional exceptions to the principle of prohibition of returning works from UK public collections, is the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act 2009, which opened up repatriation of artwork looted during the Nazi era. Aside from those two mentioned ad hoc exemption acts and processes, the UK has stuck to its guns and objected to each one of the restitution requests made by various third party states or indigenous communities in Africa, Asia, and Australasia, a stern no. Because it says that it is not allowed under the British Museum Act 1963 and or under the National Heritage Act 1983, for these objects which are considered to be part of the national heritage to be taken out of the UK. Okay, so it's always been no in the UK. In France, there, there have been quite a lot of restitution, I'll, I'll come to this in a second, but UK always no. In particular, with respect to the contested objects from the collection of the British Museum, the UK government and institution have muddled the waters proposing the development of long-term relationships with the communities sick, making the restitution claims, signing, I quote here, memorandum of understanding to develop mutually beneficial projects with artists, scholars, and other community members. Also suggesting that some new museums be built in the territories of third party states, which have made the restitution claims to facilitate permanent displays of object. But at the end of the day, the UK is still personally opposing any attempt to restitute these objects. Many commentators and members of the public think that such backward attitude towards restitution of stolen or eagerly exported cultural assets is no longer acceptable. With Vice's unfiltered history tour being a very poignant illustration of how many communities are reeling and not being able to get their cultural objects back, in particular from the British Museum. Some stakeholders even use guerrilla war techniques to shock members of the public and the press and make a point, in particular with respect to African cultural assets. Mwazulu Dia Banza, a Congolese Pan-African political activist, expressed his support of cultural restitution and the removal of African artifacts from European museums obtained during colonization by barging in the Musée du Quai Branly in June 2020 and subsequently taking a 19th century funeral post of the Bari people from this French institution. He was actually sentenced to a fine of like 250 euros or something for that. But now he has a criminal record, poor guy. Now, let's move to our second point that I wanted to, to, to report back to you today. In relation to cultural asset restitution, what actions have been taken or should be taken to allow the return of stolen or illicitly exported objects to their countries of origin? Let's have a look at the present and the future now. While French President Emmanuel Macron is widely disliked in France, and that is an understatement, in particular due to his autocratic and violent ways to impose reforms, 
He was surprisingly avant-gardist in his approach to cultural assets restitution during his first five-year mandate. Indeed, he commissioned Senegalese academic Philwin Sarr and French art historian Benedicte Savoie to research and then write an ethics report on the restitution of African cultural assets, which was issued in November 2018. The report, which I read in full, despite its 248 pages, is excellent. It's extremely well researched and it's well balanced on the whole to find an appropriate, lawful and systematic approach to ethical restitutions of African cultural assets. These African cultural assets are currently predominant in French public collections, which contain around 90,000 Nine zero triple zero ninety thousand sub Saharan African objects acquired in dubious circumstances by France. So, this report is definitely a major step in the right direction. In particular, the report suggests to amend the Code du Patrimoine in order to institutionalize the restitution process and enshrine it in law in a new section five of such Code du Patrimoine relating to the restitution of cultural assets on the grounds of a bilateral cultural cooperation agreement with countries which used to be French colonies, protectorates, or managed under French mandate. Such suggested new section five of the Code du Patrimoine and such proposed bilateral agreement templates are both enclosed to the report in its Annex two. So the two researchers have been very pragmatic and hands-on on their constructive suggestions on how to create this systematic approach to cultural assets restitution. I really do praise them for the great work they've done on that. The report does set out that such a doc restitution process would be an exception to the overarching principles of inalienability and its imprescriptibility of the public domain, in particular to return African objects to their countries of origin. Helpfully, the report sets out a list of restitution criteria, even providing a suggested timeline of the restitution program in three stages. During the first stage, sets out the report from November 2018 to November 2019. The report suggests to return several African cultural objects listed in this report to African countries such as Benin, Senegal, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Mali and Cameroon. During the second stage, from spring 2019 to November 2022, further works and initiatives should be implemented relating to inventories, digital sharing, workshops, joint committees between France and each of the African states that wish to re recover their cultural assets. During the third stage, from November 2022 onwards, the report suggests that the restitution process with respect to African cultural assets in particular should become permanent and allow third party states to continue claiming back their objects. For now, the report has been mostly wishful thinking. However, France has returned the sword of Omar Tal, a 19th century Islamic scholar and ruler to Senegal in November, 2019. And it also has returned 26 artworks looted from Benin during the colonial era after its parliament adopted an ad hoc law allowing such restitutions. The UK continues to have a stiff upper lip attitude when it comes to restitution requests. However, many think that this is no longer acceptable and push towards either the enactment of more acts providing for further exceptions to the British Museum Act 1963 and or a complete overall of this act. Even if after such amendments, the trustees of the British Museum would deal with each restitution request on a case-by-case -case basis. A potential loophole in the UK legal arsenal had even been identified in the Charities Act 2022, with new sections 15 and 16 allowing for charities, including national museums like the British Museum, to return objects if trustees felt a moral obligation to do so and gained approval from either the UK Courts Charity Commission 
or attorney general. However, in November 2022, the UK government deferred the introduction of its legal provisions, which would enable national museums to deaccession items from their collections on moral ground and therefore restitute, return these cultural assets to the communities and countries of origin. With up to 90%, nine zero, with up to 90% of a sub-Saharan Africa's material cultural legacy outside of the African continent, for example, according to the report, much more needs being done in France and the UK to return cultural assets to their rightful owners and countries of origin and put things right. Private initiative, such as a recent $15 million four-year initiative by George Soros Open Society, hoped to spur momentum in reparation efforts through legal, financial, and technical support to governments, regional bodies, museums, universities, and civil societies. This is it from me. And thank you so much for attending this talk. And I'll speak to you very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.